it, I'm thrilled to welcome Leon to uh, MSR for the keynote. Um, he needs no introduction. I'll just call out a few highlights. Um, I, I, I was uh, very happy when uh, the Turing Award winners this year actually credited uh, Leon's foundational work on neural networks in the early 90s. Also, his uh, work on large-scale learning to do stochastic gradient. He's always had profound insights on going from learning to reasoning and going from interpolation to extrapolation. But today, he tells me that title of his keynote is going to be convexity. He's just going to tell us about convexity. So without any further ado, take it away, Leon. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, uh, I would like to apologize because I saw this morning a lot of very Polish talk, and I just finished mine. So, so I hope um, there might be a chance that something inside is stupid, and hopefully you're going to tell me. And uh, the... The motivation for this talk is because the title was Geometry of AI. So I thought it had to do with geometry. And uh, um, a couple of years ago, I think there was uh, written in 2016 and 17. The mic is not on? Uh, it works. It works. OK, so I have to yell. Um, we wrote a paper that's uh, published in something that's uh, a bit obscure. But uh, it shouldn't be obscure because Braverman is the Eisenman Braverman of the kernel. And that was for the 40 years of anniversary of his uh, passing out. And uh, um, uh, that was a lot of groundwork about trying to understand the topology of GANs and what's happening. And at the end, we had a, a strange theorem that was very, very simple. And uh, somehow, we were smart enough to give it a catchy name, convexity a la carte. But I didn't think too much of it because it's so simple. Uh, and also because the results that uh, we we get with this theorem, I don't find it so good. You know, just I, I don't happy. I'm not happy with the bound. It's too too loose. But uh, in the recent years, we have plenty of papers with the neural tangent kernels and papers about the the optimization in, in neural networks. And every time I go back to this idea because I think it makes things very simple. At least it speaks to my intuition. So I would like to share that with you. And. Uh, uh, see whether this is a useful tool. I, I won't claim to say something extremely new, but it's an interesting way to look at it. So, summary, see, I'm, uh, uh, I'm going to speak about the convex optimization a la carte, and then uh, discuss what it says about approximation properties, global minimization, and the parameterization bias. And then in the third part, because uh, then I realized that you gave me a one hour slot, I'm going to try to talk about what was in the paper at the beginning, because it also gives another example where the geometry is very different, and you can still use that result. So I'm supposed to start very slowly, because at the beginning, uh, it's so simple that we can pretty much prove everything, uh, except one thing, but that's not too important. So background. So I'm working in a Polish metric space. Let's think, just think a metric space that's sort of nice. And uh, a curve is just a mapping from, let's say, 0, 1 to my, uh, my space that's continuous and connects two points. And I call it gamma subcrit t because it, I want it to be compact. So there is a lot of things about curves in uh, metric spaces. There is a whole field of metric geometry. And I'm going to shortcut much of, most of it. The only thing I really need to do is that I need a bounded speed curve, which, in fact, pretty much means Lipschitz. Uh, there is a lot of background about that because you can speak about constant speed uh, curves and then you go to constant speed geodesics and all this business. But basically, I say that if I make a small movement in the parameter t of my curve, oh, sorry, I'm just going to do that, uh, uh, the distance between the two points is not too large. And I'm going to make some definitions of weight convexity. I suppose I'm given a family of curves, c. I don't know what they are. I don't say anything about them. And I say that the subset of my space is convex with respect to this family of curves when, for every pair x, y, there is a curve that connects x to y and is completely connected in f. So basically, I can stay in my set and go from x to y with one of my curves. And I say that the real function is convex with respect to c when, for every curve, the restriction of f to the curve is convex. That is for every uh, T, A, B, basically you have the convex, normal convexity thing. 
So the first point is that if my family of curves are line segments in the Euclidean space, this is normal convexity. The second one, there is an asymmetry. Uh, I say a subset is convex when there is one curve. And a real function is convex when every curve. So if you have several curves connecting two points, the second definition is more demanding. So I can weaken it a little bit because the only thing I'm going to use is that it's convex between the endpoints. So basically, that if I draw uh, that for any t, f of gamma t is less than the mixture of f of gamma 0 and f of gamma 1. So it could be a little bit like this below. I'm not going to care. And the result is very simple. Is that if f is convex with respect to a family of curve, if a cost function is endpoints convex with respect to a family of curve, then basically all the level sets are connected. And uh, if C only contains bounded speed curves, all local minima are global. So basically, it's an essential property of convexity that's preserved in this setup where I have every curve I want. Uh, make sense? The proof of this is very simple. If I type x and y that belongs to my level set, so basically f of x is less than m, f, f of y is less than m, since, since f is convex with respect to my family of curves, there is a curve inside that connects it and stays in f. Since f is endpoint convex, I can say that f of gamma t is less than 1 minus t of fx plus t f of y. And since both f of t and f of y are smaller than m, this is smaller than m, means that gamma t belongs to my level set. Therefore, the level set is path connected, therefore it's connected. Now, the second part about the local minima, I say that a point is a local minimum if there is a ball such that uh, every point in the ball is greater or equal than the center of the ball. Reasoning by contradiction, assume there is a y such that f of y is less than f of x. So I just take a curve that connects x to y. It's supposed to be bounded speed. And because it's bounded speed, I have this property, which is the, the Lipschitz property of the bounded speed. And therefore, if I take epsilon over 2k, f of gamma epsilon over 2k is greater than f of gamma 0, which is f of x. But with endpoint convexity, I have the opposite inequality with a strict inequality. Therefore, it's not possible. Therefore, my I have my contradiction and my local minimum cannot be above the value in some other point in f. So, so far, very simple. Um, let's take a simple machine learning example. x to be continuous function from some input space to some output space. Uh, a subset in x, the subset f is the family of function that's parameterized by some theta. I didn't write parametric because I want also to have kernel uh, things. And, uh, let's L the loss be convex in its first argument, which is the output of my model. Training examples and define the empirical function where f, so with the loss, I have two f, I'm sorry. Uh, my empirical functions, cost function is f, takes a f in my uh, uh, any function, basically, and computes the empirical loss. Uh, and I'm going to take curves that represent just mixtures. They're just straight line segment in the function space. Which means that what I'm going to say now is something that could be obtained by plain convexity arguments. I'm going to relax that later. So the cost function f is trivially convex with respect to my curves. Because essentially I'm drawing curves in the output spaces of my network, for our examples. And because the loss is convex, this is convex, no problem. So if my family of function is convex with respect to my curves, the theorem applies. And that's true for linear models. That's true for kernel models. And for neural networks, well, almost. Why almost? Because if a very richly parameterized, I shouldn't say over-parameterized is not the right word here, a richly parameterized neural network has good approximation property, well, it can approximate uh, my, um, my linear mixture. So I, I can pass close to the, the, the straight line. But this is not sufficient to prove anything because uh, uh, A implies B doesn't really mean that almost A implies almost B. That'd be too nice. And this is where the curves can be useful. Um, 
So what does it mean that my network can approximate well? Well, I'm going to simplify. I'm going to say that uh, there is a f gamma theta t, so a, a function in my family, that's close to the mixture gamma t with a distance that's basically quadratic. So basically, I define around the line that goes from f to g, my two functions, in the function space. I define a kind of cigar, and I say inside that cigar, I have functions in my family that, that do that. Now, uh, proving this kind, that this kind of cigar exists, this is cumbersome. You can do it. It's just, um, you can play, play pages doing that. It's not that interesting. What's interesting is that uh, this air coefficient here gets smaller when the network gets bigger and approximates better. So I'm just going to stay at that. <laughs> so now my set of curves are going to be all the curves that are contained in such cigar-shaped regions. So when I have two points, I draw the cigar, and every curve that stays inside, they say it's one of my curves. I'm happy. And by construction now, f is convex with respect to this set of curves. Because for every two functions, there is a curve inside the cigar that I assume belongs to f. So the question is, is the cost function endpoint convex with respect to this family? And uh, well, What's happening is that if you bound the domain to some uh, fixed domain, which you can do by uh, claiming that the, anyway the, the, the level sets that move up for very high m are connected by other arguments, like the, there are other ways to do that, uh, you can say that the loss has, you can make some Lipschitz assumption of the loss, and basically you have the same kind of thing that's happening to the function. Your f of theta t is less than f of the mixture, plus some quadratic term, lambda t 1 minus t. Lambda is the product, let's say, of Lipschitz constant and the R that I had. And applying this, I get this. And this is not like strong convexity because the sign is wrong. Uh, in fact, if the loss were mu strongly convex, instead of doing this, I could add a, a, a mu t1 minus t. And if lambda is smaller than mu, I'm done. But if it's not the case, uh, I have to deal with functions that are not convex, but almost convex. They, 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 they can be a little bit above. And this is where there is the second part of the theorem, which I call the almost convex optimization. So same thing, f convex with respect to family of curve. And for each curve, the cost function satisfies something like this with a, a, a doesn't work anymore. In red, a convex variation term. And what we can say now, which is also something that's very simple to prove, is that if m is greater than the minimum of the function on f plus lambda, the lambda that appears in, then the level sets are connected. And basically, if you also have the bounded speed the constraint, it means that any local minimum is at most gamma above the global minimum. So why is it so? It's again super simple. So take two points x and y in my level set, and uh, uh, well, the value is less than m, and I pick a z in the level set so that f of z is less than m minus gamma. So I pick a z that's below. And now I'm going to make two curves. One that connects x to z, another one z to y. Actually, they're the same construction. And if I have these two curves, then I have my path, and it's path connected. So I think it's easier to see it on this graph. If gamma 0 is x and gamma 1 is z, uh, M is my level set, and my, f well, I'm not going to be below that line. I'm going to be below that red curve here. And if Z is sufficiently below X, I can ensure the red curve is all below M. So that curve between X and Z is entirely in the level set. Similarly, a curve from Z to Y is entirely in the level set. And therefore, I have my conclusion that I've found a path connecting any X and Y in my level set. So, see, it's very short. Yes? So, um, you said that you can just take the cigar and take your function class to be defined as all the curves in this. My, my, my class of curves are all the curves in the, cigar, in the cigar. But each curve corresponds to an f theta t, right? Like, how do I then map it back to. Each the curve pattern? corresponds. No, so I have several objects. I have the family of curve, which is the one which is going to allow me to customize the notion of convexity the way I want. And my family of curves, instead of being just line segments between two functions, are going to be between any two functions 
any curve that continues and stays in the cigar. To say that my familiar function, the one that's the model, is convex, I need to say that one of these curves stays inside the family. And because the, my assumption is the model has good approximation property, good enough that the cigar contains uh, approximations, I can make a curve in there. You have to be careful about continuity there a little bit. And uh, the second part is I say that the, the cost function is convex when its restriction to all the curves is convex. So in particular, it has to be convex with respect to the curve that's in my family. And I can relax this notion of convexity, actually. I can use endpoint convex, and I now say almost convex, where I assume that the convexity is defective by a coefficient uh, uh, lambda t, 1 minus t. And when it's defective in that way, the thing you can prove is that uh, the level sets are connected until you go gamma above the optimum. Oh, sorry, lambda above the optimum. Did I write lambda? Yes, I wrote lambda. So which means that if you have a descent algorithm, you're going to shrink the level set whenever you descend, you're going to go there. Now, if you remember well, I said that uh, the bigger the network, the better it approximates, and the smaller my cigar. That means that when the network becomes bigger, this uh, lambda can be smaller and smaller. And so I go to the global minimum. So, um, uh, yes? So in the next page with the proof, the gamma should be lambda, right? Like yeah. the, uh, yes, yes, sorry. Okay. Yeah, the gamma should be lambda because okay. I just changed it in the last minute because I had too many gammas in my talk. Mm -hmm. So this gamma, is, is, uh, this gamma here is supposed to be lambda, but this gamma t is still a gamma, you see? Uh, so, so I had a terminology problem. Uh, the, the slide is not so good. But the real idea is here. So basically, when I have a point that's level m and one that's... Uh, lambda below m, uh, even if I have a slight co uh, convexity defect, I can remain below m connecting them, and one such point is enough. Uh, so if you think where we are now, this says, in a relatively simple way, that if you have a neural network that has strong approximation properties with reasonable assumptions, a decent, the, the level set are going to be connected up to almost as low as you want, because you can get the cigar as small as you want. And a decent algorithm is going to work quite nicely. And the local minima are all at the bottom, which is sort of cool, meaning that there are recent results that say things like that, but they're a lot more complicated. So what can be understood from this? So if I were to discuss this, I'd say that these results are independent of the parametrization of my familiar function. This doesn't matter. The only thing that really matters is whether any two points in the familiar function can be close enough or can be either connected by a suitable curve or the suitable curve can be well approximated by elements of my family, which is sort of nice. In the theta space, the level sets can be very non-convex. They can be very bizarre but they're connected. We need a descent algorithm is going to work. But because the learning algorithm operates in the theta space, it means that whatever uh, implicit biases are in the learning algorithm are basically based on how you parameterize the things. And the things like which global minimum is returned in another parameterized model, or which solution is returned when you do early stopping, that really depends on the dynamic of the learning algorithm, which itself depends on the parameterization. So somehow the fact that you can go to a global minimum or a near global minimum and the implicit bias, they're quite disconnected. Uh, when you use mixture curves, which is what I did so far, which is curves that are either a straight line or very close to a straight line. Uh, basically, when the family of functions has strong enough approximation properties to closely represent linear mixture of any two of its functions, any reasonable learning algorithm, I mean the decent stuff, will eventually feel, find a near global minimum if the network is good enough. And there are many recent results, and actually Peter gave the list, so, so uh, they're in the line of the neural, uh, the neural tangent kernels and all these recent results, they're sort of nice. They're just typically more complex. Um, 
in this series of paper, there is one that I found quite interesting. is the one from Francis and um, O'Lyon about lazy learning, where he makes a claim that, you know, you have the neural tangent kind of approach and what he calls the lazy learning regime that goes to a solution, but this solution often doesn't generalize that well. And uh, this, we can see it because uh, we have the decoupling between the parametrization and the convexity property or the, or the convexity à la carte properties that allow me to say that I'm going down. And uh, so basically, the, the result means that the learning algorithm has the possibility to overcome the parametrization and follow the complicated uh, uh, level set and reach a solution. But doesn't mean it's a good idea. In particular, if you have a lot of solutions, the, the, the solution space is large, which is common in an overparameterized network. It might also have a very strange shape, which is connected but strange. And uh, um, a learning algorithm that with a certain parameterization might reach a better minimum than the minimum that you would consider if you just uh, consider something that does a descent without any other constraint. Uh, now, this is doomed to be problem specific, you know, whether the parametrization is really relevant to a problem and therefore allows us to have an implicit bias that's going to give a good solution instead of uh, the solution by default, which is uh, uh, still achievable, which is good to know. But uh, it's, yeah, it has to be problem specific. Or maybe you can use different curves. What about using other kinds of curves? Yes? Is there any connection? Like, can we go back to natural gradients and think about them as implying? Uh, natural gradient is a bit different because in natural gradient you consider the parametrized space as a Riemannian space. So you don't look outside. Here I'm defining a geometry in the whole space of function and then I'm defining the subset of models and I want my subset of models to have convexity properties and my cost function to have convexity properties with respect to some curves. So, so somehow, looking outside of the parametric model uh, allows me to say that what matters to me is not the parametrization, but really the, the geometry of the family of functions, when viewed to the right set of curves. So, um, no? so yes? Talking about that, can you, in, to make a connection to natural gradients, I mean, if you relate the geometry, the, the geometry of the, the Riemannian manifold by which you define natural gradient to the geometry of the curves in your curve set, I think um, that would be the connection uh, here, because that tells you how, you know, how you can move. To... Yes, but in that case, uh, you have the, second, the first property, the convexity of the family of function is uh, achieved by default, because you're just looking inside, and the second one gives you problems. So the, the trick here is that you can balance the two. You know, when I had the problem that because my, my family of functions were not convex because uh, they were just approximately, they could just approximate a line, I was able to say, okay, I'm going to take more curves and then the play with the other part. So it allows me to shift the difficulty from one hand to the other hand of the, the, the theorem on the, on the convexity of the function versus the convexity of the family. So it's... It, um, I didn't know when I wrote it, uh, but it turns out that it's quite a powerful tool, even though it's super simple. But this is my, this is what I think now. Maybe I'm wrong, you know. Just I thought that a lot of people might uh, tell me if I'm wrong here. Um, so that gives me a chance to discuss what was actually in the paper. Because, so in the paper, this was at the very end of the paper to give a result that I never liked very much, and I'm going to, to speak about its shortcomings, but there are some interesting aspects there. So it's about implicit models like GANs, VAEs, and things like this. And it's also a nice example, because it's an example where I'm going to use very different kind of curves and mixtures. In fact, I'm going to show that mixtures really don't work. So the reason why I'm interested in implicit models is because uh, I would like to find the important properties of the world rather than the one that are specific to the particular distribution. I want to find important properties that are invariant across distributional changes of a certain kind. That's another talk. But basically, instead of having a, uh, sorry, instead of having a model that's engineered to resume the true data distribution, so Q is very close or inside the model and I can use any distance, 
I want to use very simple models that reveal important properties, but I don't care that the data distribution is realistic. So the distance between the true distribution and the one in the model, the, one, the thing I'm going to minimize, really matters. And uh, if you want to do this, maximum likelihood is not the good tool, because what is a simple model? It's something that involves a couple observed or latent variables. Uh, the distribution is degenerate, supported by a low dimensional manifold. That means it doesn't have a density, so there is no density estimation. So the workaround that one uses is to augment the simple model with a noise model, and then you tweak the noise model until you get the result you want, and you call it unsupervised learning. And it's not really it, but uh, I would like to know whether it's possible not to have to add a noise model, but just find interesting distances that have the, the right properties. And I should say, I haven't found that yet, but uh, in the way there are a couple of things. So implicit modeling is that I have my observed data that follows the distribution Q, and I have a known distribution that I push forward through a parameterized function in order to create a parametric distribution, and I can get samples. So basically, you have two samplers, one that's data limited, another one that's unlimited, and I want to compare this distribution in order to optimize theta. So the good thing is that this can have a low dimensional support. Basically, uh, this is very good to represent distributions with uh, 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 low manifold support. Uh, you can write that in mathematics. What's interesting is this hash notation that's common in transportation literature, where I say that g theta hash nu means the push forward of the distribution nu through the function g theta. I'm going to use that a lot. So. And that's good for degenerate distributions. <coughs> so now, compare distributions. So before being too smart, we can look what's in the literature, because there's a big literature about comparing distributions. And you have what are things that basically generate the strong topology, like the total variation, kullback leibler which requires densities. It's not a distance, because it requires densities, asymmetric, possibly infinite. Jensen Shannon, which was what was used in the, the first version of the GANs, and that nobody uses because it really doesn't work. That's symmetric, doesn't require density, is bounded, and the square root is actually a proper distance. And then you have the more recent things. So there is the Wasserstein one. So the Wasserstein distance, uh, I, I assume everybody knows, or should I explain? Maybe I can explain because I have time. <laughs> so I have my two distributions, P and Q, so that's the graph I took from uh, the, Perret, uh, the Gabriel Perret introduction. Two distributions, P and Q, and I want to find the joint distribution with marginal P and Q, and the joint distribution tells me where I should transport grains of probability from one, to, from one distribution to create the second one. And so pi is this, uh, so it's the minimum of uh, all distribution, all joint distribution that have marginal P and Q of some cost function. That tells me the, whether the transport is expensive or not. And by the duality theorem, is the supremum of all Lipschitz one function of the expectation over the first distribution of f of x minus the expectation of the second distribution of f of y. That's always defined. Uh, it involves the metric of the underlying, underlying space, either in the density there or via the Lipschitz one nature of the function. And that was the inspiration for the Wasserstein GAN, which is almost Wasserstein-ish, but got some successes. So another one that surprised me when I saw it, I first saw it, because I'm an ignorant, you know, in the paper by Dadian Bouchako, and that's the energy distance of uh, Zekeli. And it's a bizarre thing where you take the expectation of the distance between two points of the distribution and you times two, and you remove the inside the distribution uh, differences. And uh, you can show, and I'm not going to do that here, that this is the same with uh, basically the distances that I'm using here, or the kernels I'm using in the MMD uh, method, the Archer Graton MMD, uh, play the same role essentially. And again, you have uh, this, both Wasserstein and uh, energy distance MMD uh, define the weak topology, meaning that it depends really on the, the distribution of the metric space below. And for disco GAN, they also, like, they also approximate this uh, supremum with neural networks, or they do something smart with the kernel? No, they do smart with the kernel, I think. Uh, 
I don't, and uh, by now, um, Arthur Gretton has new methods that he called MMD GAN, where he does something smart with the kernel, but also adds an adversarial term. So in fact, he escapes the, this definition. So then we're going to have the same geometry. <coughs> so now I'm going to look at mixtures in distribution space. You know, for every t, p0, p1 are two distributions. pt is the mixture of the two distributions. You know? And uh, um, I suppose that I have a set of distributions that are defined implicitly by a generator. And I suppose they're mixture convex. Maybe I say mixture convex to mean convex with respect to the uh, set of mixture curves. Uh, so that's what it means. Basically, for every mixture, there is uh, theta t, such that uh, pushing mu to g theta t gives me my distribution. And the problem is that if p0 and p1 have disjoint support with non-zero margin, then either t to theta t is discontinuous or theta to g theta is discontinuous. In both cases, it's going to be very hard to learn because learning discontinuous function is not fun in terms of optimization. And the proof is simple. Let's take two distribution P0, P1 with uh, disjoint support <coughs> separated by some margin nu, just uh, there here. And for all epsilon positive, however small, G theta zero of Z, so the, the output of G theta zero always belongs to the support of P0 because pushing forward nu through G theta zero implements P0. And for all epsilon, g theta epsilon of z belongs, belongs to the support of P1 with probability epsilon. That if you have a mixture, however small, some of the z's must be diverted from P0 to the support of P0 to the support of P1. That means that therefore there is a z so that the distance between g theta 0 of z and d theta epsilon of z is greater than nu. And that regardless of how, how small is epsilon. So this essentially means that if you have a mixture curve in probability space and uh, you want to take a curve between these two distributions, you have a continuity as to break somewhere. Cannot be continuous. So, but this means that the mixture curves do not match the geometry of implicit models, not at all. We need other kind of curves. And well, you go to displacement curves. So I go back with Wasserstein a transportation plan from P0 to P1 is a joint distribution whose marginals are P0 and P1. And we say it's optimal when the expectation of D X, Y to DP, expectation with respect to the joint distribution is minimal. So the exponent P is the one of the Wasserstein P distance and the same drawing here. Now, in the Euclidean case, because if the, the underlying space is not a clear end, you have to follow geodesics, it's more complicated, but let's take the simple case. A displacement curve is, I'm going to define PT as uh, pushing forward a mixture through the optimal transport plan. That means that I take my optimal transport plan and I take my grains of probability starting from the distribution P. If I follow the full transport plan, I'm going to Q, but in the transport, I'm just going to drop them at a fraction t of the way and see what distribution I get. Now, let's suppose that P0 is a g theta 0 uh, hash mu, so the, the push forward of mu through g theta 0, and P1, the push forward of mu through g theta 1. Well, uh, if I push forward both, I have a joint distribution, that's a transportation plan. And if I push forward a combination of the two, I have displacement curves for this transportation plan. So basically, if the family of G theta function has strong enough approximation property, this can be close to the optimal plan. It's not actually needed because I can take the T theta zero theta one I want. And this near optimal displacement can be close to G theta T uh, H mu. So basically, again, uh, with a bunch of caveats that, are, that are, can be complicated, I don't really want to, to overclaim here. Uh, I'm just going to say that uh, when the G theta family is rich enough and uh, approximates well, it's natural that displacement curves are inside the family. 
So basically, the displacement convexity is a natural notion of convexity for a family of distributions defined by an implicit model. And such families are typically not mixture convex because of the argument. If they are, you have no discontinuities that are going to make them useless. And you can contrast this with families defined by parametric density functions. When you have a parametric density function, if the parametric density function has high approximation property, chance that it's going to be able to approximate a superposition or a mixture. And therefore, mixture curves are quite natural when you estimate densities. But when you have an implicit models, the natural curves are really are displacement. And the question is, which cost function are displacement convex then? Because that's another piece of crap. So remember the implicit modeling. And I'm going to give you a couple of facts. Uh, first one is, how different are Wasserstein and MMD? Uh, well, I'll leave aside the strong topology because they also have discontinuity problems. That was the topic of the wasserstein gall paper. And I take the Wasserstein and the energy distance. And when you explain them in dual form, they're very close. The only thing that's different is the supremum. On Lipschitz 1 function, function that are one Lipschitz bounded on Wasserstein, and the RKHS ball for MMD. And uh, because I'm an ignorant, I thought, um, oh, that should be very close because um, yeah, but I discovered that it's a pretty big difference. Yes, uh, it was clearly clear. <coughs> but uh, uh, Lipschitz one is clearly bigger, but uh, it's not because you can approximate a lot of things with uh, RKHS that the RKHS ball is close to Lipschitz one ball. Anyway, uh, you can then discuss the geodesics. When the space of distribution is equipped with the energy distance or MD distance, you can show that the shortest path between two distributions is just the mixture curve. It's interesting to look at the shortest path because when you minimize the distance, the shortest path is something quite important in terms of convexity. When the space of distribution is equipped with Wasserstein P, the only shortest path are displacement curves. In Wasserstein 1, you have both of them and all kinds of hybrid uh, curves that are a little bit displacement, a little bit mixture uh, in different parts of the space or different uh, levels. It's, Wasserstein 1 has a lot of geodesics. Statistical properties. Um, if I look at the expected distance between the distribution Q and its empirical approximation on endpoints, well, for energy distance, it's in 1 over n. For Wasserstein, it's 1 over n to the uh, 1 over d dimension. So it's a catastrophe. And this is rich. Sanji Varora has a nice example of the canosphere where this is completely reached. And that seems completely hopeless. But what's happening when you run it? Uh, in practice, EDMMD works well in low dimension. This is what was in the Bouchako paper. The, the other paper is different. Uh, in high dimensions, it gets stuck very quickly. Whereas the Wasserstein training seems to work quite well. I wouldn't say it's very easy or smooth or, or it works as well as normal neural network. But this sort of works. Yes. So to give you an example, it is the typical uh, uh, sunset, uh, bedrooms that are used in all these uh, uh, early image generation problems. These are the examples. When you train with MMD a certain neural network, you get that. These are the generations. When you train it with vast certain distance, you get this, same network. So why is it that the the thing that has the most horrible uh, statistical properties you can think of works so much better. And I know that this uh, picture you're looking at, it's a kind of beauty contest. It doesn't say that much. But still, you know, it's, it's a consistent effect that you can see a lot of data sets. Uh, there is something in there. <coughs> so how things can go wrong? OK. Uh, this is an example, super simple, with uniformly. It's completely made up. But it's made up to show that it's possible to have a situation where uh, the energy distance has local minima and the vast search time one doesn't. It's a made up example. It's designed to do that. But at least it's a proof of concept that uh, you can get local minimum with energy distance that you don't get with vast search time. Now, uh, I spoke about the convexity of the families. I'll just speak about the convexity of the distance function. So what I'm going to minimize is dqp theta. So the cost function p to dqp, is it mixture convex? Is it displacement convex? 
So mixture convex is easy because you have straight lines, so it works, uh, that's easy. Displacement convex is more complicated because I have first to convince you that this is not generally true in a metric space. So just take, take, take a, uh, L2 equipped with the L1 distance. So the Manhattan, like distance, except uh, without the discretization of the street. Uh, the geodesics are just uh, going uh, vertically then horizontally in the simplest way. So this cross here is, is uh, L1, uh, uh, is convex when you equip L2 with the L1 distance. In terms of the, sorry, it's convex with respect to the set of geodesics uh, induced by the L1 metric in L2. But the intersection of two convex sets is not necessarily convex, not even connected. In addition, if you take the distance to zero, you see that these two curves here are geodesics. Uh, but the blue one is clearly convex if you take the distance close to zero, and the red one is not. So basically, it's not a given. And, uh, <coughs> okay, mixture works. The Wasserstein distance is not displacement convex. So here's a counter example. Take Q, which is uniform on a circle. P is uniform on a stick that rotates in the center. The stick has length 2L. If you display plot Wasserstein of Q between PL and theta, it doesn't depend on theta because it's rotational asymmetric, it depends only on L, it decreases. So basically, when the stick is bigger, the Wasserstein distance is smaller. This is quite intuitive, actually. Now, rotate the stick a little bit and do um, a displacement interpolation between P1 and P0. It's taking PT here, but this PT is not following a curve, it's following a straight line. So this, uh, sorry, the, this dot dot line here is straight. That means that the gray segment is a bit shorter than P0 and P1. And because it's a bit shorter, the vast distance is bigger. <laughs> There's still hope. And basically what you get, the hope is that you can write a theorem that I don't like too much because the bound is too gross, but that shows that uh, even though there is a violation of the convexity, you can bound it by a term in t1 minus t times something. Now the something doesn't decrease when I increase g theta. This is why I don't like it. It's a fixed quantity that depends on the function. And so when you, the proof is some gluing uh, thing that's uh, Pretty much elementary, it's just a bit cumbersome, but not even actually, it's not very difficult. Uh, and then you can apply the almost convex optimization theorem and conclude uh, that there is a guarantee that optimizing an implicit model with Wasserstein has only local minima whose value is near that of the global minimum. But the near is not really as good as the one I had with neural networks because I cannot reduce it by increasing the, the approximation function. Even if I could approximate exactly my function was, was convex with respect to Wasserstein distance. My family of functions was convex with respect to Wasserstein distance exactly. Uh, I would still have this extra term. So, well, I was not psyched with this, but anyway. Uh, I think it's interesting to see because it's an example where something that's essential to machine learning, which is the geometry of probability distribution, uh, can be equipped with curves that are very different from mixtures. And sometimes you have to, in the case of implicit models and you can still get some kind of convexity results and optimization results in that way. And when we wrote the paper, so I told you I was not psyched about this result, and the theorem looked too simple to me, but my observation was that this kind of results really, are, they're not that simple. They're much more difficult to get in general in the literature. And with time, I started to change my mind and thinking that mm, maybe actually this uh, trivial theorem is not that bad because it makes a lot of difficult results quite simple. So my conclusion is that Convexity with respect to mixture curves make clear that optimizing a regression model with strong approximation properties <laughs> with decent algorithm yields a near global minimum. This property is independent of the exact parametrization. It says nothing about the implicit biases induced by the parametrization and how best to exploit them. Uh, in implicit generative models, convexity with respect to displacement curves seems more natural than convexity with respect to mixture curves. And is there a potential here? Like, think about images. You know, in images, mixture of images is a piece of crap. Don't know that. In images, the natural geometry is a displacement geometry. And so there might be a potential to use uh, weird curves and prove interesting things for some kind of networks, in particular, all the networks that work so well in images. But I haven't done that, and I don't know how to do it. So that's it.
the time for questions. Yeah. I, I did not understand in part two when you started to talk about generalization. I mean, the part one was all about the training. No, I didn't talk about generalization at all. No, no thing about generalization. I'm not saying at some point that there it's like. Oh, oh sorry, sorry, sorry. Part two. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I, I see. I see what you mean. So, the property that ensures that the descent algorithm can go to a near global minimum uh, is reduced to some kind of convexity property. It doesn't depend on the parametrization. Yet, the parametrization is what the descent algorithm follows because we work in the parametric space. And therefore, it, it, it creates implicit bias. They're going to decide which solution you're going to find. And uh, if you do early stopping, they're going to decide where you stop. Now, um, picture, for instance, a, a solution space. So it's a level set at the zero level, so it's connected to. Uh, that's very bizarre in data space. Um, the result says that it, it, up to that level set, I'm connected, so I can go to one of them. It doesn't say that I'm going to go to a good one. On the other hand, by changing the way the family of function is parameterized, even if it's the same family of function, I'm changing this geometry quite a lot. And I could very well reach a solution that's superior in terms of generalization. You could. I could. And if I do, this is something that's very problem dependent because it essentially depends on how the parameterization is set up. You said at some point that like, kernel met, like that this was a proof that kernels would generalize not as well as if you train. No, it's not a proof of that. Okay. Uh, in the, if you take the, the paper, the, the lazy learning paper of uh, Francis right. and uh, his student, and I'm, I'm, I should remember his name, I'm sorry. Shiza. Hmm? Shiza. Okay. Uh, I don't think it's Shiza, it's Olayon or something like this. There is a trust student. Also. Okay, well, <laughs> anyway, if you take this paper, they, they show empirically that the solution you get by following the, the tangent uh, kernel uh, tends to underperform on a number of tasks. And then there is a kind of argument of, uh, um, but that's the end of the paper. The beginning of the paper is show that this kind of lazy learning can appear in a lot of models when you change the scaling in particular ways. So, so it says it's not a rare property, and it doesn't give much in terms of generalization guarantees. It's not clear that this solution is a, is a very good one. That's quite consistent with things we know in practice, you know, that the kernel methods, they, they work, they give solutions, but in practice, they don't seem to generate as well as the CNN on image stuff, and for good reasons, because the parameterization of the CNN is very well suited to image stuff. But I'm just trying to understand, I, I understand what you're saying, but it's not, part one does not explain what you're saying right now. Part one, it, uh, part one explains that the property of going to a near global right. minimum is only a geometrical thing. Yes. That's, not, that's not parametrization dependent. That has nothing to do with Since parametrization is an orthogonal concern and has an impact on the implicit bias, it's going to matter. This is all I'm saying. Okay, all right, that's it. It's all I'm saying. It's recording. So, say I try to establish complexity with respect to either displacement curves or mixture curves. Can I do something to the descent algorithm now that I know that the problem is convex under this class of curves? Can I? One, I have no idea. And two, even if you do it, it doesn't mean it's going to take you to the right solution. Somehow, I think that the fact that you take a model that's at the same time very powerful in terms of approximation property and at the and at the same time, is a very convoluted or worked on in terms of parametrization is something that's useful. It's nice to decouple all those. You, know, you can say, well, with models that are this powerful, I'm going to find a solution. And now I can work on the parametrization to make it suitable for my problem. And doing so, I'm changing the dynamics of the learning algorithm, maybe towards more interesting stuff. So, so I, I agree very much with the philosophy, at least as far as I understand. But uh, you know, the, the idea that if the level, level sets are connected, then a descent algorithm finds a global minimum is intuitively appealing. Intuitively appealing, but it's not 
it's far from obvious, right? I mean, you need, because it can be, if you have a descent algorithm that runs in continuous time and then a month. This is the second part. If C only contains bounded speed curves, all local minima of F are global. So if you have an algorithm that finds a global minimum, local minima is going to be global. And for the second part, the almost one, I didn't do that, but it's, it's the same kind of proof. You know? Right, but it could be that the set, couldn't it be that the set is so, you know, uh, perhaps this is ruled out by the bounded speed curves. Well, but, you need to use... That the set is, suppose, for instance, that the number of parameters that you're using is exponential. Of course, you will not be able to, you know, implement Descent. the algorithm in polynomial time. Well, I, let, what I mean, that, uh, I didn't speak about polynomial. If you have an algorithm, that does descent in a reasonable way, meaning that you can say it's going to find a local minimum, right. then it's going to find a near global one. This is all I mean, really. Yeah. It's not a, it, the level set is a kind of weakly argument, but I guess it's geometry, I guess. So yes? let's say if the surface is flat, the, you could have connected basically sub-level sets, but you still don't converge to to global optimal, right? Like That's why I have bounded speed. To get the, you know, what's happening with the bounded speed is, um, uh, that's one actually. Basically, uh, if I uh, take a, a local minimum, so basically around my point X, I have a kind of space in which either I'm going up or I'm staying flat, and I have a point that's below, I need to draw a line between the center of this flat zone and below, and because the zone is flat, it has to go below at some point. And that contradicts the, the endpoint convexity. I can draw it if you want, maybe. Uh, you have x, and a1x, my function is flat. I have y that I assume below. So if I take a curve between x and y, and this curve has bounded speed, basically I can find a, a t somewhere that's below. And so basically, the, the, the value of the function in uh, gamma t has to be higher than this uh, linear descent line. So basically, that shows the thing. The, the bounded speed is very important there. And in the other case, actually, I realized later that it's even simpler. Uh, well, it's actually the same thing. You, know, you have the z point that's uh, lambda below. You have the level m. You have x. You have a flat zone here, and uh, uh, well, you want to go to Z, and if Z is sufficiently low, you're going to have your, your arc, your quadratic arc that's entirely below. So basically, uh, but for this, you need bounded speed, because you need to know that when you uh, move T by a little bit, you don't make a huge displacement in the, in the function space. <laughs> or the bounded speed, it, it, uh, why does it? Uh, well, that's the, the flat zone. The bounded speed is uh, actually it's here. I think. Forgot. If I try to find it now, I'm going to find it wrong. <laughs> okay. Yes? Yeah, so first, a uh, uh, result is universal approximator. Uh, how do you guarantee that the <coughs> curve you find is continuous? It, it seems that... Well... <coughs> because for every point, there is an approximator, but maybe these are just discrete things, right? So yeah, I, I realized that when I said it. Because <laughs> I know exactly how to show that you can find a bunch of points in that function without the continuity. That's quite easy, you know, you bound outside, you... Uh, that one I don't know yet. I'm sorry. I just realized when I said that there is a continuity issue that one has to, to sort out there. But, uh. you, you, you might have to be able to approximate the function and also derivatives. Okay. I have no more questions. Thank you. Okay.